there and welcome back to Real Estate Renovators, the show designed to help real estate agents navigate through the proverbial shitstorm. My name's Jason Cunningham and it's a cracking day here in sunny Melbourne. But before we get into today's show, let me introduce my fellow co-hosts. To my right, none other than this country's finest legal eagle, the Persian Princess, Big Rexy <laughs> Afrasiabi. How are you, sir? I'm great, mate. You? Yeah, really good. Good to see you as always, Rex. And thank Pleasure's you mate. for having us in this uh, palace. Uh, <laughs> to my left, it's your favourite and mine. We know her as Kmart. Her name is Chanel Mackesy from Titanium Recruitment. G'day, Chanel. Hey, Jace. How are you? Very well, as always. What are we, what uh, chic behaviour is going on? Don't bring it up because I've worn this dress before in another episode. Now I've outfit repeated and now you've blown it. (laughs) Oh, and this is the first time I've worn this shirt. (laughs) It's a little sort of an in gag. And who could forget our favourite man from Bris Vegas, Pete Aquila. G'day, Pete. How are you, pal? Hey, Jace. Morning, team. Morning, Pete. Now, today, I didn't even respond back to Pete because I show him disdain. No, sorry, Pete, no, I am <laughs> Today's show, I reckon, is probably going to be one of our finest. So I've got a bit of a bias lens with this one because the gentleman I'm about to introduce has 46 years' experience in the industry and uh, pretty much runs and navigates real estate in the suburb that I live in, the Turak at the North, which is Essendon. And his <laughs> name is Brad Teal. G'day, Brad. How are you, pal? Very good. Thank you for having me. Welcome, Thank Brad. Welcome. Yeah. Thank it, you. It's good to see you, Brad. I mean, you and I have known each other for a while. We're both mad Essendon supporters. Uh, no. it, it, Brad's an ex-board member of the Bombers, and we might talk a little bit about the relationship uh, of elite sporting clubs and how they run their businesses so effectively and, and what you've gleaned from that. But before we get into that, Brad, tell us how you found yourself in real estate. Well, as a, a kid, I went to a one of my mate's parents' uh, birthday. And I came across a guy called Ted Ashton. And Ted uh, said to me, young Teal, can you box? And I didn't know what he meant. And he used to box uh, spa with Lionel Rose and Jack Rennie in Essendon. And Ted ran a real estate business called Edward M. Ashton in Napier Street, Essendon. And he lived just around the corner from Diamond Street, where I was born and bred. And he said, right, get up the Dukes. And he landed one on my jaw and he landed one in my bread basket. And I was a bit <laughs> shocked. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. But uh, about an hour later, he came up to me and he said, young Teal, you haven't been and had a whinge to anyone. How are you feeling? And I said, well, I was a bit shocked with what you did. And he said, I like your style. Do you want to come and work for me? And I had planned that I would get into town planning and I'd applied for that at RMIT. So long story short, I put my bike into the back of his LTD on Saturday the 21st of September 1974 and went down to the office. He gave me a receipt book which was folded, a key which was a master key to 50 flats in uh, Flemington, in Farnham Court in Flemington. And I rode down there and every flat the folder had the money in it and I pulled the receipt out licked it, stuck it in, took the money, went to the next one. And I rode back in 1974 with about $4,000 in my uh, satchel. And then the next Saturday, I went around to all of the shops in uh, Essendon, in Buckley Street, Lincoln Road, in Pascoville Road, where the shopkeepers couldn't get out. And I'd collect their money, which was all cash. And the following week, I'd ride up to Glenroy and do uh, Salisbury Street, 12 and 14 Salisbury Street and then Fletcher Street. So over a period of four to six weeks, I continued to rotate. And uh, that's how I started in real estate. You, you might refer to that as real estate. We call it bag handling. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, I don't know if you know this, but Chanel's probably the number one recruiter in the country. And she just mentioned to me earlier off camera that she placed somebody in your business. Chanel, in your experience in recruitment and HR and people and culture, how do you think that approach of someone giving a left and a right and an uppercut <laughs> to recruit somebody into the industry, how would we go today in 2020? With well, that? I would like in real estate to getting kicked in the bread basket repeatedly, isn't it? Yeah. Realistically. Yeah, that's, that's life. I <laughs> mean, it is. I think it shows obviously strength um, and resilience and I think it's a good recruitment. I'm going to start using it. Um, as a, as a titanium, repeatedly punching property managers in the face. Last one standing gets a job. I like it. I know, but it's actually, it's good to hear a refreshing story like that. I mean, for everyone out there thinking about hiring someone, I don't think it's appropriate to hit someone before you hire them. Maybe really um, <laughs> But no, in all sincerity, it's good to hear, you know, back in the old days, in the glory days of, you know, um, how far we've come and collecting cash in envelopes and all mm-hmm. that sort of stuff. Tilly, so you started with uh, this uh, Mr. Ted Ashton. Yeah. yeah. When did you sort of, when did you take your first foray into opening your own office? Well, mum and dad had always operated their own business. And so I had a sense of what, being your own boss was all about. And I had a vision. 
I tried for a long time to buy a share into uh, uh, Neil Anderson's business, which was on the corner of Fletcher and Mount Alexander Road. And for one reason or another, that didn't happen. So on the 13th of April, 1987, I opened my own business at the age of 30. And from there, it's just grown. And How many years were you in the industry by the time you opened up? Well, 16, oh, roughly. Right. Six, uh, 70, 13 or 14. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and where, is that where it is now, the same spot, Mount Alexander Road, well, your first I, office? No, I've moved from 1025 to 1122 yeah. and now 1126, so yeah. next door, I'm, I've got those two. Mm. But yeah, just across the road, and that was a space issue mm. uh, where we just were growing so quickly and uh, we moved there in 1991, four years after I opened the business. Brad, I've often found when having conversations with entrepreneurs and business leaders like yourself, that typically it's our family of origin, uh, you know, that where we're brought up that sort of instills some of the behaviours. You mentioned that your parents were in business, yeah? yeah. Uh, and I know you've got a brother, your brother works with you as Craig well. Craig works at Keeler, yes. Yeah. Um, so tell me about the formative years and the conversations you'd be having with mum and dad around the kitchen table and those sorts of things and yeah. why that gave you the impetus to start your own yeah. thing. Well, as kids growing up, uh, it would be, Brad, can you ride up after school and give me a hand to fold metal? And mm. during the late 60s and early 70s, we had to work to make a dollar to buy fuel for the boat. We were water skiers. And if you wanted a new ski, you had to buy it yourself. And mum and dad provided everything, of mm. course, and we'd go away camping. But every school holidays, we'd work up at the factory and it was always the worst jobs. Um, and yes, I've been... Um, the, the, the person who was hooked up with a block and tackle when dad left the building and um, left up there and Jimmy's back and then I'd be let back down and dad would come <laughs> and say, why do you look white? I've been up there for the last hour and a half. Yeah? <laughs> or um, you know, the fuel thrown under the, the prepsil thrown under the door of the toilet and lit and all of those things that you actually read about and hear about. <laughs> I've actually had them done to me. Um, and, and so it's a hard school of knocks that we were born and bred in. Um, yeah. But learned how to uh, run your own business. The more you worked, uh, the luckier you got was a mm. bit um, uh, of the story. Mm. And mum and dad had that flexibility where dad could come and be the team manager on Saturdays or the coach or whatever it might have been for all of us kids, team manager at tennis and cricket and football. So they had that flexibility because they ran their own business. Mm, mm. And they were able to, when we were all in bed, dad went and did the books or mm. he'd get up really early. We wouldn't see him leave at 5am mm. to go and weld and spray paint and get all of the horse floats that were built over the 60s and 70s in Australia. Dad made all of those. Mobile libraries, uh, public works vans that um, we'd drive up to Bright and leave five um, caravans there. That's what I was born and bred yeah. into. Work, work, work. Brad, your journey. So you set up your first office at 30, after 16 mm -hmm. odd years in it, mm -hmm. and now you've got eight offices. Yes, yeah, seven, uh, seven. Um, two departments work out of one office. Yep. Yeah, seven, mm -hmm. seven offices. How, can you talk us through that journey? How did you go from one mm -hmm. office to two to three? And how, how has the growth happened? Well, it's such a short period of space as well. Yeah, if you get so busy and you put someone on, and if I was running at 1.5, 1.8 people, full-time equivalent, where you're just running frenetically, then you'd put someone on. And before long, they were working to 1.5. And so between the two of you, you are now at 3.3 or 4. And so you put another person on and they pick up momentum. And all of a sudden, you have five people working seven or eight people full-time equivalent. And... And it just grew. And so we moved to a larger office. Uh, I had an opportunity to buy a business in Pasco Vale and then at Flemington. Uh, and then we grew through acquisition of rent rolls. Yep. Um, so, so did you just acquire rent rolls or you took it back over to office as well? Uh, some occasions I did, but other times I moved them in to get the economies of scale yep. where you would move the properties in and it might be, be bring their people with you. Uh, but you got the economies of scale of system and floor space. Mm -hmm. So we've grown like that. What was that, Pete? I was just um, wondering um, what part, part in your growth did property management play, Brad? Did property management play a big part? Mm. Enormous. Yeah. yeah. yeah look, the, the part of Brad Tool Real Estate and, and many of the bigger agencies, you see signboards that um, relate to 
uh, what's for sale in an area. And everyone would say to you, oh, I, I, I see your signboards everywhere. Yeah. But in actual fact, that's the part of the iceberg out of the water that everyone could see. The part of the iceberg under the water was we're up to 3,700 properties under management. And that management across the group um, takes a lot of work mm. and it takes um, great systems and very, very good people. And I'm fortunate that along the way, I've got, and I'm, this is off the top of my head, but I've probably got five people working with me now between um, 27 and 30 years. I'd have another five at wow. um, 25 to 27 years. I'd have another five at 20 to 25 years. I'd have 15 people between 15 and 20 years, and I would have 20 people between 10 and 15 years. That, so, Tilly, uh, that yeah. is amazing. Mm. Amazing yeah. to have that longevity. It uh, just shows uh, your leadership. Yeah, yeah. well, t yeah. tell me about that. How has that been fostered? I mean, Chanel, you, you're in this space, you know. Unheard of. Yeah. yeah. Mm. T tell us how that's happened. Well, I find that likes gravitate to each other. So if you respect someone and you give them total control, like one of the things that I do now is not go to meetings. Mm. And running a big organisation, I have wonderful management. I have uh, Antoinette, the CEO. I've got fantastic financial people, uh, Rhonda, Prue runs rentals. Everyone has a designated job. Mm. And they are trusted with what they need to do. And when you are Brad or Brad to your real estate, if I go into a meeting, the overhang of Brad on mm. opinion and suppression of other people's opinions is significant. So I trust what they do. Sometimes I think I might have done it differently. I shut my mouth and I just get on with it. And selection of systems, I'm not even involved in that. Now we've just moved to a new software platform. I did not go to one single meeting. Yeah, right. Uh, now I just support and their examination, Lisa, Antoinette, Prue, Rhonda, uh, Rachel, everyone who is involved in that decision-making process against uh, about advertising, social media, the various software platforms called Logic, uh, Property Me, uh, RP Data, whatever the platforms are, then I trust that they will make the right selection and do it appropriately. Yeah, I just find th that that's just really warming listening mm. to that, Brad. And I, this, sorry, Chanel. And yeah. the thing that I found most uh, engaging was that your awareness of yourself uh, yeah. and and the fact that if you did, you know, the Brad from Brad Teal Real Estate mm. walks into the room, everybody stops and looks to you to say what's the right answer, yeah. and to have that awareness to pull yourself out of that environment and let people be the very best that they can be. And the trust in your mm. team. Yeah. yeah, and they are. They're, they're wonderful people and they've been with me a very, very long time. And that's the result of what has now meant that the company is in transition to this next um, level that's of that's um, change on April the 1st. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's everyone has taken me to that point. Yeah. Can I Sorry, Pete. Brad, there's a lot of people in the industry that stumble from going from an owner-operator to getting to the point where they're actually able to manage their business from a distance, as you have achieved. If you were talking to some of those leaders, what are some of the things you'd tell them that they need to achieve to actually get that to happen in their own business? Um, do what you do best. Um, so often people are promoted to a station above their ability. And hmm. just because you're a really good salesperson doesn't mean you're going to be a great sales manager. And people are elevated to the wrong positions. Hmm. And so what I do now is list and sell. I don't take any direct calls. I work my um, network and um, through the solicitors, the banks, accountants, referral from friends. That's all I ever do. The call-ins to the office go to another department. I don't even look at the facts and figures of what they look at and their win-loss ratios, but I know overall intuitively what goes on, uh, so I have a handle on that. But do what you do best and don't spend $1,000 on a $100 issue. And by someone who is a really, really good salesperson, you take yourself out of that, your gross commission income will drop while you're managing other people and trying to get them up to speed. Mm. And so you've got to know in your heart what you do best and do it. And too many people try to have the manager's cap on, the sales manager's cap, the auctioneer's cap, the payroll cap, and you can't do it all. Mm. And understanding what is your best attribute and making that your choice is what is best for your business. Now, Tilly, uh, you today, 46 years in, uh, seven officers and a number of team members, you can afford to do that today because you've got the team around you. 
uh, if you were to rewind 30 years ago, you didn't have Rondas and all these sort of rock stars. So you had to perform every role. But as you grew, you brought the right people in. Is that right? Or? Yeah, I've, I've grown. And, and what it's really been about is over-invest early and people will grow in. Mm. If you try to fit everyone into a narrow um, script or uh, this tiny envelope, you're trying to get everyone in and um, it won't work. So you give them a bigger envelope and people will grow. And that meant that then I had people I could take out and put into Pasco Vale, down to Flemington, out to Keeler, out to Caroline Springs, mm. over to Avondale Heights, mm. into Ascot Vale. Mm. Some of those were purchased with rent roll and offices, but, and you picked up staff along the way. But by putting the right people around you and elbow room for them to grow into, mm. it meant that they actually grew with confidence and had capacity they could take to another office. Brad, before we go any further, and I'm sorry, Rex, no, no, uh, yeah, before we go any further, it'd be remiss of me not to talk about hammer time, which we know is under the hammer. <laughs> I just like getting things wrong because that's one of the gifts. Tilly was talking about operating your genius and the things that you're good at. The thing that I'm really good at is fucking things up. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's, we're over to under the hammer. Now, under the hammer, Brad, is 60 seconds or thereabouts uh, of rapid fire, short answer questions. Mm-hmm. And I'm gonna start with Chanel. If you weren't in real estate, what would you be doing right now? Be a fighter pilot. Fighter pilot, Ooh. nice one. What motivates you? I get asked that a lot. Is this a short answer or? You can give us a lot. No, no, no. You can give us whatever you I get asked like. that a lot. Look, you've got to love life. Um, and part of loving life is surrounding yourself with people who enjoy who you are and you enjoy them, but also beautiful things. You work hard and you want to fly overseas, not, not the next few years probably, yeah. but you know, hit nice golf clubs, drink fine wine, mix with great people, drive a beautiful car. You build an asset base that means you are financially independent and that is my driving force, mm. financially independent of the vagaries of changes in government policy, whether there's a global financial crisis, a pandemic, whatever it is, I am financially independent against mm. all of those things. And that's what has driven me. Tim Watson, Joe Watson. Tim. Michael Jordan, LeBron James. Who are they? <laughs> 23. AFL or NRL? Oh, you're kidding no. me. <laughs> AFL or NRL, Brad? AFL. <laughs> Brad doesn't know what NRL is. <laughs> V8 supercars or Formula One? Or Formula One. Uh, V8 supercars. Mark Winterbottom. <laughs> it's got the Brad Teal emblem on the side yeah. of the car. <laughs> um, biggest accomplishment outside work and family? Outside of work and family. Um, uh, competitiveness. I, I love being competitive at golf. Um, never out of the game. That's the great beauty of handicaps. What are you um, off, Tilly? I play off 12. Yep. Um, and have great mates that I play golf with, play at some beautiful golf clubs, and uh, that's what I enjoy. Mm. Got you. Brad, before we jump into some of the questions that Rex wants to talk about, I, I, I want to talk about um, your family. You're, you're a big family man. Mm. Uh, your grandfather, mm. uh, which is uh, exciting. Tell me about um, your family and how important they are to you. Yeah, well, family is enormously important. My mum and dad are 88 and 85, and they're a driving force of the whole family, mm. a couple of um, brothers and a sister. And mum and dad have set the, the bar very high for us. They've been um, huge community-minded people, great social consciences, and uh, they have lived their life to the letter of um, integrity and transparency, and they're wonderful, wonderful people. Um, my, my children are very important to me. Laura is, uh, she works in the business of Brad Hill Real Estate mm. and she's a goer. She works long hours. Uh, she looks after her mother uh, like the best carer you've ever seen. Wendy doesn't hold great health at the moment and Laura is um, her rock. Uh, my son Lachlan is a work in progress. He's had a lot of issues since an accident in 2012 mm. and that's a work in progress. and. Um, you know, we work together a lot on that. He's living with me at the moment, mm. and uh, that, that's been a journey and a half. Um, it was a pretty traumatic time in your life, in your family's yeah, life. Yeah, uh, it was. Yeah, Lachlan got hit, we're on a push bike, got hit by a car. It was a pretty tough time. Yeah, and he spent um, eight days in a coma on life support, and we've never really recovered from that. Mm. Um, and he was a fitness fanatic and a great bike rider, and uh, uh, he was working in the business as well, and mm. uh, all of that stopped on that day, and I... I started writing a, a book and it's probably 
a couple of chapters in and it was the phone call that changed my life because at 7.17 on the 2nd of August 2012 is when I got the phone call from the emergency department about, you know, you're the father of Lock and Teal mm. and you can't get anything out of them on that phone call. And oh, then yeah. to drive into the hospital and be in traffic at the end of the freeway, urging the traffic to move at 8.30, the news came on and there's a bike rider in oh, um, a critical condition in Royal Melbourne and that's my son and you just... You can't, the world just stops for this period of time. Mm. And uh, I remember that night I went home to get some clothes. I stayed in at the hospital for about, um, you know, virtually the 10 weeks nearly. Mm. But um, I got out of my car and I was just so emotional. I screamed at the top of my voice, please take me, don't take my son. And, oh, uh, mate. Uh, so that's been a journey and we live that day to day. Um, so, but that, you know, they're so important to me that I, I get in front of the Southern Aurora to protect them. Yeah, thanks for sharing that story, Brad. And um, yeah, that's actually quite touching. And as a parent, yeah. Yeah, but Brad, thanks for sharing that, mate. Um, And yeah, it just shows, I I think, you know, Brene Brown is is a leader uh, and uh, she has a lot to share. She talks about the power of vulnerability. And and I think, Brad, you're sharing that with us now. And and we could all in the room feel how powerful that story uh, was and is. And and, touching. and, And very touching. And and the impact it's had on you and your family. And, you know, Brad, I, you know, I've known you for a long time uh, and we got to know each other through the Essendon Footy Club and a few other things. And Laura manages one of my properties and, and all that sort of stuff. But as a kid, I grew up in Essendon, as you know, and I'm very proud of the fact that I, I, I live in the Turak of the North. Uh, and we used to play billiards, play pool. And a good mate of mine, Nick Mitchell, uh, who you possibly know his old man, Gus. Very good and, footballer. Yeah, very good footballer. And, uh, when you uh, have a shot of pool, and I'm pretty rubbish at pool, you know, you miss the pocket and you leave, and the ball sort of sits there. And we used to call it, nah, that's real estate. We'd leave it for later on. Yeah. Now, if it was in a really good spot where you could just cushion it in, we'd go, that's Brad Teal real estate, right? Ah. But, if, but if it was off to the side, we'd say one of those dodgy ass, you know, shit real estate agents. <laughs> shit ones that get about one listing a yeah, year, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so I've always wanted to tell you that story. That's Brad Teal. Yeah. <laughs> Brad, can we draw about 46 yeah. years in real estate? So you've been a part of watching technology take over real estate. You've watched the industry shift. You've watched, you know, going from one office per suburb to now quite a saturated market. How do you, would, firstly, how do you adapt to all the changes within your business and remain up to date with technology and changes and legislations? But also what, I want to really want to know, what's your opinion on real estate in 2020? Not real estate market, but the industry. Well, real estate has changed dramatically because years ago, it was very much along the Dale Carnegie um, theme, which Mm. was to try and make someone buy something they maybe didn't want to buy. Mm. And I remember funding, we would get given four home loans for a year by back then the Resi, um, and they were bought by National Mutual and created the Bank of Melbourne ultimately. Mm. According to the deposits that you had, where you try and redirect landlords funds into the Resi accounts, Um, you'd get given four home loans. So you had to be selective about who you gave the money out to uh, just to try and assist a sale at 12 and 13 and 14% a long time ago. But back then, um, it was very much about uh, the salesman. Today, it's about communication. The salesman, it's nearly impossible with consumerism that you'll get someone to buy something they don't want to. So what you've got to do is communicate the availability of what stock is available to the right buyers. And that becomes in here and in here about your feel for what a buyer will want there. Uh, Will they look at that postcode style of home, number of bedrooms, land size and price band? And how does that fit in? And it's the filtering process. A lot of that is done by the computer these days. And so it's how well you put in data, it's how well you use that data that is more relevant now to cover many, many more bases. Like we have, I'm guessing, 45,000 fully profiled buyers at Brad Teal Real Estate across all offices from Gisborne to into inner city Coburg and Brunswick. And every buyer has their wish list. So when you put in uh, looking for a home to $1 million, it might come out with 10,000 people. Mm. But when you profile four bedrooms, postcodes surrounding five kilometres, that's when you start to get down. And, and so it's gone from no computerization, and I still have the recipe cards. And my saying at work is if you still want to use recipe cards, well, go and write a cookbook. Because <laughs> recipe cards with people's name and everything. And I, I 
have had, we talked about this this week at, at work, how I had a lady ring up and say, you sold me my home 35 years ago. Can you come and look at mum's unit? You sold me my property 32 mm. years ago. Can you come and value it and mm. estimate it? Mm. So the difference from way back then to now is all about how computer literate you are, number one, mm. and how smart you are at driving it. Yesterday, I did an open over in Pasco Vale and I had 11 people through and here I am, I left my iPad at home and I downloaded um, Agent Box. I got my code, I put it in, and here's Brad, my age, and your name, uh, your mobile number, please. Oh, you've already been through other properties with us, uh, successful, and I logged them in. Oh, can we have a contract? Bang, uh, contract section 32, off it went. And I can do it, anyone can do it. Mm. And I'm computer aware, but not as uh, uh, literate as many, many people, particularly younger people who have grown up with it. But I can do that, anyone can do it. And that's the advantage now of um, today's modern world. But for me to ring someone and say, I've got a cracker, I think you should come and have a look at it, bring your checkbook, you're gonna buy this and be ready. Um, it, that doesn't hold any water with anyone anymore. Yeah. Not that I ever said any of that, but yeah. you know, that, it, that's, no, you invite people. With Before Pete jumps in here, I want to know your thoughts, Brad, around particularly the entitlement of agents in 2020. When I say entitlement, you're someone that spent 17 years literally starting from the ground mm -hmm. and growing this mega business. And now we've got agents now that have been with a business for a year and they want the highest commissions once they go out and open offices when they're not really ready. For, well, what, yeah. what's your, what is your opinion on the entitlement within the industry That's right now? That's a great now? question. Yeah. Thank you, um, Jase. The, the commission that is available on a sale of a million dollars, the people have lost relativity with the real world. Um, that a commission might be fifteen or twenty thousand dollars, and that's a lot of money. And someone who wants to back their own judgment can hang their shingle and be mobile now. Um, and if they want to make uh, twenty-five sales a year at twenty thousand um, dollars, well, you do the maths. Um, they can actually make an earn out of that. It's uh, half a brick. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, people see that they real estate sales people lose that relativity about i can make a list and sell commission get paid superannuation guarantee get paid holiday pay and get paid car allowance which takes you to about 47 eight, nine percent depending on the agency of the commission nearly 50 percent rounded off there's not a business in the world that allows a salesperson to be in business with someone with no costs yeah. so we all risk yeah all risk and mm. so the the Great businesses of Melbourne provide a great platform for support in administration, advertising, social media. They are at the cutting edge of all of that for their salespeople who, if they are no good, they will not be able to carry that branding forward. But if you're um, saddled with all of the right branding and you go and you are a personal um, character, you will make good money. Tilly, I've got to say this to you, mate. Listening to you speak now, you, you sound like a wonderful advocate for the industry. Mm. Uh, just the way you're communicating, the fact, what I'm enjoying is the fact that you, in 1974, you were collecting cash. <laughs> you know, to, for the, you know, so you've been there, you've had the recipe cards, but you, so you, you'll never forget where you've come from, no. right? You, you sound very grounded for a person that's very successful. Um, Yet you also have the ability to adapt to change. I mean, I'm thinking about you on the mm, on the iPhone. Yeah, yeah. on, you'd be struggling all day. <laughs> With that figure. <laughs> He's like, oh, Joe, I'm so adaptable. I did this. It would have been an hour per person. Yeah. How do you do that again? Why does this on? <laughs> Tilly's still got a Blackberry in his phone. <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I take the fish, but I mean this sincerely. Do you do much work with uh, REIV or your industry body? Because uh, I, I can see you giving back to the industry. Well, yes and no. Mm. Um, the industry body um, is run by a really good guy, Gil King, and Leah Kalman uh, is the current president, and she's in for her third year. And Leah is a really grounded person. And Leah and I talked all over COVID when the state government created the omnibus regulations and mm. Leah would ring me, I'd ring her and give her advice. She'd say, you know, have you heard what they're going to do? And we'd talk through that. And I would like to think that some of what I uh, said had an impact on Leah and mm. she's very good for the business of real estate. And the RIV, 
seen, I think they could still do more, particularly in training. Um, the, the business of real estate now is about go and poach rather than train. And I think that's a mm. folly of the industry mm. that there's not enough um, underwriting of staff to come through and people are seduced out of one job into another and it's all about money. And I don't agree with the way that happens these days, but it's the reality of the real world. It's really refreshing hearing. And yeah. it's funny to say refreshing with, uh, and I say this respectfully with some, someone of your vintage. But, uh, keep it. You know, no, sorry, Rex. No, no. Uh, I was gonna say, you're an inspiration for a lot of people in the industry. Or if they haven't been, you will be after this, hopefully. Mm -hmm. But, and you've, you've grown an office from one to seven and done everything, but you're also at an age where succession now is in the cards. And yeah. I understand you've, talk, you've gone through this succession planning. Yeah. Can you talk us through? Yeah, look, Exit strategy on real estate. Yeah, How, what does that look like? Succession planning is um, a word that you know, when you come up for a review with a bank every couple of years, they say, oh, what's your business plan? Well, what do you mean? Um, you know, we are what we are and mm. we're growing and, and our pipeline of stock and our commissions and uh, debtors and creditors and all of that. And they go, well, what's your succession plan? And uh, you know, when you're 50, you don't want to worry about a succession plan. But as you get older, you, you start to think about it. And as you get older... Um, what happens is all of the people who are around you are getting older as well. And so you become their succession plan. So I've been buying them out. I'm going the wrong way on the share register. Um, but the bottom line is that uh, in September of 2019, I was approached to <coughs> see if I would sell an office. And I said no. And then would you sell two offices? And I said no. And then in February of 2020, we spoke about uh, I was approached again and asked if I would sell those offices. And I said, no, 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 it's under control. But if you want to buy the lot, I'll have a look at the lot. And that was a very flippant throwaway line. Mm. So over that February of 2020, we talked and we argy-bargied about a multiplier and what comes with it, what doesn't come with it, and exactly where I wanted to be in four and five years' time. And bottom line is around about the 15th of March, and if you are thinking 15 March 2020, mm. what was going on in the background yeah. during COVID-19. Yeah. So we shook hands on the 15th of March and ordered um, heads of agreement to be drawn up, stop. COVID came, lockdown 28th of March, uh, Easter. Uh, no one had an Easter because we were locked down. And over that period of April and May 2020, the whole thing founded. We got back to work and there was a little bit of mojo in the market. So we got back to it. We talked, we talked about the maneuvering of staff and brand and license fees and the multiplier and funding. Uh, Macquarie Bank have been fantastic. Mm. Mm. But really the spirit of it uh, for Brad Teal Real Estate to now on April the 1st be joining the Woodards Group yep. to become in our area, Brad Teal Woodards, uh, because they acknowledge the value of the brand in the part of Melbourne that I can see from 32nd floor here. Um, that, that's that been a great acknowledgement as well. And John Piccolo from Woodards has been fantastic to deal with. We just about could have done it on a handshake. It's yeah. been, the spirit of it has been great. Mm. And that happens on April the 1st with um, me taking a diminished role with the overarching business selling. And then I'll buy back some interests um, in various offices like I'll, hold a, a reasonable interest in Essendon, a little bit in Pascoe Vale, a bit in commercial, and then Keela Sunbury Gisborne. Mm. And the inner offices will go to operators uh, like Anthony Balabira mm. and um, uh, Sam down at uh, Ascot Vale. Mm. So, and um, uh, Jason from Carlton, uh, that, that they will take up those areas, that more, more uh, inner city area. Mm. So I will continue to um, rain on my patch, so to speak, for a few <laughs> years to come. And despite what the industry says, yeah. Brad's retiring. Brad is not retiring. Yeah. Has uh, it been emotional though, Brad? Yeah. This this process of letting go somewhat. No, I, I'm I'm completely over it uh, in <laughs> yeah. terms of um, like over it and, and in control of it. But it was very emotional. A day I told the staff, mm. yeah, I wow. got on a Zoom and I had a lot of tears that day on the Zoom. And I thought, just compose yourself, Teal. Mm. Um, but that was emotional because it you was... You needed that Ashton blade to come in and give you a left and right again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you concerned about retention now with the staff that now that it's it's a no. re, re, or merge or... or no, it, it is a merger. Um, 
No, uh, we've got to give people 28 days notice and yesterday we sent out a thousand notes to uh, landlords and the day before and I've had a number of landlords write back and wish me well, uh, just like copious, like hundreds of emails mm. back. Fantastic, Brad, well done. Um, the spirit with which it's been uh, accepted around that um, you know, everyone has watched what Brad Teal mm. Real Estate has done and they know who I am and what I've contributed along the way. Mm. And people actually slap you on but, the back and go, really Brad, well done. What about your legacy, your brand? You're keeping Brad Till in the name For a still. few years. Yeah. For a few years. How, yeah. how does that make you feel about keeping the legacy aspect mm. of it? Legacy doesn't pay bills. <laughs> oh, great <laughs> answer, <laughs> <Dealing. Yeah. laughs> um, Look, the legacy of Brad Till in five or eight years' time when Brad's off down at Queenscliff mm. mowing the fairway or doing whatever I do, mm. um, other people can come forward and put their hand up and dominate their area. And it's the local people with community involvement entrenched in their local schools, footy mm. club, cricket, uh, kindergarten, squash club, whatever club you're mm. in, that community social conscience is what someone else can carry forward. See, yeah. Brad, I would argue, listening to you talk earlier, I, I would argue that you've let go already. You already let go with the running of your business. You, you, you spoke about having an, a team that's autonomous and giving them enough rope so that they can make their own decisions. Yeah. And I guess this sounds to me like it's just the next step in that progression. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, look, it is, but you still need oversight. I still sign the checks. Yeah. Um, and Or if it's not a check signing, I mm. muck around with that number and <laughs> tell them there's a number. Um, but, is it a tech savvy boy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a number on a thing and I put Absolutely. it somewhere. Yeah, exactly. And um, so... Look, I'm still aware of everything that goes on. Not much happens. Intuitively, I know our auction stock levels. I know our sales at a time in the month. Mm. Uh, I know rental vacancy. Mm. Uh, I know a risk list. I, but I just know they're under control. But if I walked in and said, can you give me the... I'd know proportionally a percentage, 1, 2, 2.5, um, 80, 90, 100 upcoming uh, auctions, stock levels at 250. I know all of that mm. and... I'm aware, so intuitively you know how you're traveling. What was that, Pete? Uh, I, I just want to go back to, on a number of times today, Brad, you've spoken about your family being in community and yourself being involved in community. What does that mean and how has that supported your business? Like, what is it when you say community and what have you done in those, those instances? Look, my family uh, were very good sports people. My sister played uh, midweek local tennis and does Pilates and um, goes to the races in syndicates where they, they were at Flemington yesterday and had a wow of a time. You see the photos from Ray come through last night in the family WhatsApp. Um, my brother was a really good footballer, um, played you know, 350 games at Keeler. Mm -hmm. um, and my other brother plays midweek social tennis uh, with a great group of guys. And you get bolted on by association because mm. none of those family members and mum and dad, mum's um, uh, champion midweek local tennis player. At 84. Um, at 84, yeah. 85. 85. Um, she gave tennis away a couple of years ago, but just absolute A-grade tennis player. Mm. Um, plays golf twice a week at Midway. Dad bowls five days a week at Buckley Park Bowls. Very much the name mm. is synonymous with the northwest of Melbourne. Yeah. And they've never mucked up where... Um, you've had to worry about someone um, stamping a bad name. Uh, it's always been, I've prospered through there, uh, ridden on their coattails as well. So. Isn't it interesting, guys, how having a really strong community around you, whether that be sporting, um, Pilates, your community, mm. and the impact that can have on your business. And I find that now a lot of young agents, and, and no disrespect to any, they are self-serving, mm. where they're marketing themselves on social media. It's them, it's their car, it's their house, it's mm. you know their skills, where they're not focusing on a wider reach of the community. Mm. Do you see that a lot now, Brad, that they're, they're sort of drifting away from your old school marketing, which is actually yeah. one of the most beneficial ways of marketing, which is being involved in your community? Yeah, the, the push through Facebook of uh, Brad's just, I'm not on Facebook personally, but the mm. company is, but uh, the push for Brad to put on his Facebook page, I've just listed a new home, no representation of the company and what it's all about. It's all about their immediate social uh, impact and their self-esteem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in the business, and this is the balancing act, when you start with supporting local clubs and schools, etc., it's all about your close mate becomes a treasurer of a football club and he says, listen, Tilly, um, do you mind if I whack you in for a couple of thousand dollars? Mm. Well, 
10 years later, you're throwing in $4,000 yeah. and you have no real direct involvement with it. It's all about your mates and that grows like topsy. So about three or four years ago, we redrew that whole community sponsorship uh, and giving program to uh, what we give now, we must have some in connection with. So a staff member or a family member must be directly involved in um, the club. Buckley Park Tennis mm. Club or yeah. uh, Keeler Football Club, Keeler Cricket Club, mm. um, the Queenscliff Golf Club, that's my fave. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and all of these clubs, um, the Northern Saints, whatever the football club or cricket club, but Essendon Baseball Club, wherever it is involved, it's a connection mm. that we get direct involvement with. Yeah, mm. Brad, can you just, uh, how many team members are across the Brad Peel group? Uh, last count, we had over 95. Yeah, so. Wow. Mm. So tell me, at 95 employees, tell me about the Christmas party. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's no partners. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Remember, he that. signs the checks. <laughs> before, you say, before you go into the Christmas party, Brad, so now that you've merged with Woodards, yes. how many team members will there be across? I'll probably end up with uh, about 55. Mm. No, no, like collectively now with Woodards and Brad Till oh, merging. Um, well, they've got 18 or 19 officers, of which I'll be involved in um, six or seven, six maybe. Mm. Um, so, you know, we'll represent about a third of the volume of offices. I don't know about the gross mm. commission turnover of rentals and everything, but it's going to be a massive business right across Melbourne. Yeah, where's the Christmas weather um, going for the MCG? Yeah, but, 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 Marvel Stadium. Be, I don't think that they have a, a, an overarching... I don't know, but yeah. that hasn't been high on the order of... Or something like that. No yeah, they might, yeah. 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 You, you know, um, one thing I've enjoyed is that... Um, and my parents have always shared this with me as well, that... As much as the world changes, some, a lot of things stay the same, right? And there, some core fundamental core values stay the same. Uh, the fundamental community piece that you keep talking about, you're a big community man. Uh, anyone that lives in Essendon knows who Brad Teal is and knows uh, you know, your impact on the community. And I think with the, uh, the hiatus that we all took as a, as a, as a result of COVID-19, really reinforce the importance of having connection with the community. Mm. And that underlying core value, I think, has really come to the surface. And I, it actually warms my heart to hear you say that, you know, we did a deal, a handshake deal, two weeks before some lunatic bit into a bat and coughed on everyone. And I shut <laughs> off, yeah. down, right? Yet that, that handshake agreement was honoured by oh, two, two titans in the industry. And I, I mm. think it's a really good story, mm. Brad. And I, I just want to say on behalf of myself and my co-host, I really want to thank you for the humility that you've shown today. And mm -hmm. we're going to get to Pete's cheat sheet in just a quick second, but the, your ability to share everything that you've shared um, and the vulnerability, I, I, I found it so warming. And this mm. has been our second record today. Normally, Rex would have fallen off the stool and gone to sleep, but we've all <laughs> just been so engaged by this, mate. This has been, uh, this is outstanding for me. Happy you. to come along. Yeah. Thank you, Brad. Uh, over to you, Pete, with the cheat sheet, big boy. Thank you so much, Jason. So we've had an overwhelming amount of response to Pete's cheat sheet and the request or a, a large percentage of the request was about dealing with new business. So this episode's resource is all about dealing with new business and how you deal with it. It'll be on realestaterenovators.com as a download. And thank you so much for all the inquiry around what we should be producing as resources. Back to you, Jace. Nice work from you, Pete. That's the end of our show. Once again, thank you, Brad Teal from Brad oh, Teal Real Estate. You. Chanel Macassie, one of the country's finest. And I love what's going on with the blue there. And Big Rexy, you're a superstar. Till next week.